Tonight, we are talking about the perils of Occam's razor, uh, which I think is a pretty fun topic and uh, for many people, possibly quite an obscure topic. But nevertheless, um, hopefully at the end of this, you'll have found it to be um, as interesting and, and useful or meaningful as I think it is to talk about. So Occam's razor. <laughs> so I went on the internet and found some different um, uh, meme, memes and stuff about it. So shaving away unnecessary assumptions since 1285. We have this razor blade that I guess, I don't know if you can actually buy these, but in any event, uh, was online. Here's another one. Occam's razor, uh, simply the best. That's a great pun, right? <laughs> Wait. What is the correct spelling? So um, we have to have everybody, uh, if you're going to um, make questions or comments, oh, does this turn on my Landra? Okay, we have to have you use this, and maybe we get. Turn it on and off. So you point, no, no, you point no, no, your no, mouth. Yeah. Uh, I was just curious what the proper spelling of Occam is, or Occam. Yes, and so we're going to do two different ways to um, spell it, and so there isn't particularly. I would say there's not a proper spelling, in a sense, because what we have here is um, a name of an. It's an English place name, in the town Occam, uh, and. Okay, there's a, uh, and, and that has a modern spelling of it now, uh, and that's gonna be O, I think it's O-K-H-A-M, um, and so, and that town is, um, you know, in a, bit of a little bit southwest of London, and so that's how it's spelled now. This Occam spelled this way uh, is because, um, uh, anyway, our modern English didn't even exist. It was still developing Middle English at the time. Um, most of the literary language at the time is Latin, and so William of Ockham is um, almost always written out, his name is almost always written out in Latin in the contemporary sources, and Latin doesn't almost ever use Ks. <laughs> and so essentially this spelling here, Ockham, you know, is coming from the, the Latin version. And so that's why we can have more than one spelling of it. And so I will often, and you'll see it often spelled this way when we're talking about Occam's razor, <laughs> and yet when we talk about William of Occam, we often spell it the other way because of the town, which is now spelled that way in England. So anyway, simply the best, so that's a pun, as we'll get to, <laughs> that somebody's made here. Uh, easy science, and it even applies to data and analytics, according to um, this meme. And then this is another one. You can got, apparently buy a t-shirt, Occam's razor, cuts through the crap. <laughs> so anyway, that's the bunch of different ideas. So it's a present day idea, at least enough to sell t-shirts and have memes. So what is the idea of Occam's razor? Um, it's also sometimes called the uh, Lex Parsimoniae or the Law of Parsimony. Um, and the idea of it, as it's simply put, often put is, the principle that simpler solutions are more likely to be correct than complex ones. And so parsimony is an English word that we don't always use. You might say someone's parsimonious if they're really cheap. They don't like to give big tips because of their extreme parsimony. Um, it's unwillingness to spend resources, and since we think of all resources in monetary terms, we often put this with money, but in this case it's meant to be um, metaphysically parsimonious, or at least for as far as William of Ockham is concerned, so um, uh, philosophically or metaphysically parsimonious. So the razor, um, as it exists in kind of our intellectual toolkit of today, has been a very useful in conjunction with things like the modern scientific method that has been evolving subsequent to William of Ockham's day. Um, and it's therefore this razor has been useful in developing all kinds of different um, scientific models in a whole wide range of fields from mechanics to biology. Okay, so let's look at use the Mockham's razor. <laughs> so we have uh, this kind of situation. We might come, might come home to our apartment and ask ourselves something like, what happened to my pillow? <coughs> you know, and so one of the possibilities would be we could posit <laughs> The existence of Oompa Loompas, who have a characteristic of hating, for example, red pillows, and who are also able to enter apartments through extra dimensional rifts in the time space continuum. So, that may be one way that we could posit what happened to the pillow, you know, with multiple, creating multiple extra steps and things like that. 
or maybe it was this guy, <laughs> you know? So in other words, that's a simpler explanation to answer the question and maybe it's to be preferred by the uh, principal here of the razor. Who built the pyramids? <laughs> in the same exact way, we may well posit the existence of otherwise unknown aliens who built large technologically primitive structures like pyramids without leaving any mark on the historical archeological record other than the fact that the pyramids are there. So we could deposit that, you know, or maybe it was these guys who built it, <laughs> you know, something like that. In other words, the Egyptians themselves. Um, and so those are the same kind of models of how we do it. So that said, um, what Occam's razor is not is an irrefutable principle of logic. Um, instead, it's going to, and we're going to use two words here that we don't use every day. <laughs> it's considered an abductive heuristic. <laughs> so what's an abductive heuristic? Well, a heuristic, uh, uh, there's a bunch of different ways we can define it, but one of them is a, an approach to, a prob to problem solving that is practical, but it's not guaranteed to be uh, uh, logical, the logical or correct one necessarily. Uh, and abduction is a kind of, as opposed to deduction or any of the other kinds of ductions, it should say abduction, not abduction. <laughs> it's a, that's a typo. I should say ab abductive heuristic. I don't know why I, I, my, my, my um, typewriter was not using Ds for some reason there. So abduction uh, and a logical inference of uh, the simplest explanation for something starting from observation. So as we observe things and we try to explain it, um, and we use logic to kind of find the simplest explanation. So as you can see, that kind of is related especially to the razor here. And so therefore, um, the idea of uh, the razor is that it's a useful tool, um, but it's not guaranteed to produce correct results. So that's not what the thing is in terms of logic. So it's not like at the basis of logic as we've done, for example, we did logical fallacies and we looked at the kind of the basis of Aristotelian or Western logic where we start with essentially the principle of non-contradiction, where A can't also equal not A. Right? And so um, that's kind of like at the heart of this. This isn't one of those things where we have a robust proof of it. Um, and in fact, we actually often find that the universe is complicated and sometimes the more complicated answer is in fact more accurate than the simple answer. And this can especially be true in humanities. And so my field is history. And really in history, um, uh, if you always are using Occam's razor to get down to historical explanations, you know, you'll get to essentially the Marxist maxim that everything, the answer to everything is always economics, right? So you get to essentially, um, uh, uh, it essentially becomes reductionistic as you, as you oversimplify maybe. Uh, you can make a model and you can say, okay, yeah, the reason why this all happened is economics, but then as you want to pull back and get a more accurate picture, you'll see all of the other causes and factors that go into something that are beyond just that, the top re the reason, let's say. So for example, in terms of a historical question, if we do the same thing like my, uh, my room and the pillow and who did the pillow, what caused the First World War? And so we might uh, jump and say, okay, you know, the assassination of the Archduke Fran Franz Ferdinand of Austria in Sarajevo <coughs> by uh, uh, pro-Serbian, you know, Serbian, uh, um, anyway, at attempting to get the Austrians out of the Balkans, that that was among the war's causes, of course, the fact that that is maybe the precipitate cause that caused, every, that caused everything to spiral out of control and got all the nations involved in the World War I a century ago. But almost every historian would agree um, that calling let this particular event the sole cause of the war is completely unfounded. So it's not the, the there were all sorts of other kinds of um, structural causes that were there that this particular event is more or less the, the, the lights off the powder keg, right? What so all of <laughs> Yeah, what caused all the pillows to just fall down? Uh, uh, <laughs> Oompa Loompas. <laughs> probably. <laughs> we'll just say probably Oompa Loompas. Okay, so we have that essentially what it is and what it isn't, but we also want to talk then now a little bit about the eraser's name. So in addition to not being a law, this abductive heuristic of parsimony was known actually long before the character William of Occam, and now we're getting the other name, or the other way of spelling here, Occam's razor, or Occam. Uh, so for example, if we go all the way back to Aristotle, fourth century BC, in his book, The Posterior Analytics, we read 
Aristotle says, we may assume the superiority, uh, ceteris paribus, which is to say other things being equal, um, of the demonstration which derives from fewer postulates or hypotheses. <laughs> so, you know, ph philosophers love to you know, make everything so very clear, right? So, I mean, if you can probably, you would probably get this though, right? So, essentially, if everything else is equal, you know, so this isn't like, again, our, our, one of our, our first principles, but as long as we've already, you know, logically, we've got everything else being equal, if you're trying to now logically demonstrate something, um, you know, the, uh, it's superior in Aristotle's view here to um, have fewer postulates or hypotheses in order to get to the steps. So if you have, again, that's just the idea of uh, fewer um, uh, steps in reasoning or assumptions that you have to make are gonna, be, are gonna have a more robust uh, logical explanation. Or at least, again, it's not a, um, this is not a proven case, but it's something, again, uh, that Aristotle is aware of and promoting all the way back in his time. So it's not from William of Ockham, necessarily, who made it up. Um, and although, in fact, uh, William of Ockham frequently appealed to this principle of parsimony, he actually never uses um, uh, a razor <laughs> as a metaphor. So although we, I've already started using the razor as a metaphor, and we talk about shaving off, um, well, like in the t-shirt, shaving off the crap, <laughs> but anyway, shaving off um, unneeded hypotheses, in other words, getting down to the simplest answer possible. Um, that razor metaphor is not actually in Occam's writings, nor, in fact, did he ever state, or there's nowhere in his writings did he state this, com this common for formulation, simpler solutions are more likely to be correct ones. He did write, quote, plurality must never be posited without necessity. <laughs> which is sort of his formulation for the razor. And, um, and again, we mentioned about how uh, philosophers make everything so clear. <laughs> but you can see what the idea here is, is that, um, it, again, we have, we have to have, uh, if we want to try to logically um, establish something, if we can do that in like two steps, or with just one postulate or two postulates, then that's going to be, um, anyway, we, we should do that. <laughs> rather than having a whole plurality of them because that we don't need because it's not needed. In other words, we can prove it with two steps, we don't need to have eight. And so that's essentially him, um, his formulation of the same kind of principle. Um, although his contemporaries, there are contemporaries who um, got really upset with him and who <coughs> actually um, argued and postulated or who wrote out, you know, exactly the opposite because, for example, since this is not something that is a logical proof, this is not a, a law or a principle that must be, and so uh, a contemporary said, wherever you have a logical proof that relies on only three um, hypotheses, it is improved by adding a fourth, <laughs> you know, and so on and so forth. So in other words, you might as he believed in adding complexity because he was kind of upset with the idea of this reductionism. So, with that said then, who is William of Ockham? So let's look at this. So William of Ockham is born around 1287, so the end of the 13th century, probably in this town of Ockham, which is southwest of London, England. He was raised as a Franciscan, and he's probably from childhood as an oblate, which is to say um, his parents at some point or other uh, they had a bunch of different sons, and you get to, let's say, the third or fourth son, and you kind of have a sense of him, you're like, oh, that one's kind of for the church. <laughs> and so when you do that, then they get to, whatever, six or seven or eight, and they give them to uh, um, one of the monastic orders, in this case, the Order of the Franciscans. Um, in a lot of different cases, um, the orders sometimes had rules against it, because the idea of it is it's hard to, um, it's hard for a kid to, um, make a true, let's say, vocational decision to become, oh, I'm ready to dedicate, I mean, as an eight-year-old, I'm equipped to uh, dedicate my entire life to God in, in religious service through taking monastic vows and things like that. So considering that that was problematic, it, people, I mean, there's like, art would argue against the practice. On the other hand, um, when you did it, uh, uh, the kid would get a lot better education than he would have had you know, like by hanging around uh, whatever his regular household would have been up until that time because he's hanging around these monks who are essentially um, uh, 
uh, philosophers or whatever who are able to, he's able to like learn Latin almost as a primary language then, this language of scholarship and is able to do all of this kind of reading and developing uh, the brain while it's still much more plastic. And so actually a lot of the cases where we get to the kind of uh, people who are our medieval geniuses, they are often um, these oblate kids, you know, who got put in there early. There's a question here. Is it oblate mean, the question is, does oblate mean obligation? And it means, yeah, uh, do you have the, do you, John, or I'm sorry, Yvonne, do you know the, the? I think it means sacrifice. Means sacrifice, Yvonne says. Um, I'm trying to think of, it's a, so, it's a irregular Latin verb. <laughs> it's a, a <coughs> ofero fere o tuli oblatus. <laughs> I'm trying to think of it, and it's like, a, yeah, it's a, I offer. So it's from, o, you know, ofero is the present, and so it's like offering. And so, uh, you know, and, and so oblatus is the, um, Past participle, so it's a, a, someone who was an offering. You said a person who has been offered is what it means. So yeah. Okay. So what about? So we're going to look at each one of these different things. So I want to look at medieval England, Franciscans, and um, scholastic. Oh, I didn't even get to the next part. <laughs> so anyway, so he's trained uh, among the Franciscans as a scholastic philosopher, and he became one of the most influential thinkers of the Middle Ages. And although we've said before, although he popularized parsimony, um, in fact, the name Occam's Razor is modern. So I guess it, 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 no one has been able to find it in the literature before the, um, before the 18th century. So it's more modern, a popularization uh, uh, that uh, connected William of Occam to this particular principle and named it this way. <coughs> okay, so look at each one of those things individually. So looking at later medieval England, so, um, Occam is born a little over two centuries after the Norman Conquest. So if you're just thinking about like the timeline of England's development, some 70 years after uh, the miserable King John um, lost all of the, uh, his family's lands in France at th after the Battle of Bouvines against uh, Philip Augustus, the Capetian King of France. John actually failed to even show up to the battle that decided his fate. <laughs> um, anyway. In that amount of time, Middle English had been developing out of Old English, and so uh, Chaucer, who you are probably aware of as the most famous Middle English poet who wrote the Canterbury Tales, is born at the end of Occam's life. Uh, Occam, however, when he's born, still and all the way up to Chaucer's time, if you think of like in Chaucer's, one of the Chaucer's Tales, the, I think it's the wife of Bath, who speaks, um, you know, French, but she doesn't know, but of the, of the French of Paris, she doesn't know anything, right? So she speaks French in what, in this kind of um, uh, evolving Norman English French that, um, that isn't stylish, you know, anymore, and things like that. And the people in France kind of think, oh, haha, you provincial <laughs> people who speak that way. So it isn't actually clear as a result, because we don't really know anything about um, William of Ockham's background. He might have come from the nobility uh, or lesser nobility, and if so, he might have actually grown up speaking that kind of um, Norman French, or he could have spoke, grown up speaking Middle English. We really don't even know. Uh, his writing primarily is in Latin. So among the friars then, so who are the Franciscan friars? So Occam is raised as a friar. Um, the Franciscans and the Dominicans uh, were, which they're still around to this day, and so you might be aware of the two orders. Um, they are among these new mendicant orders, which is the idea of mendicant means the, the begging orders, <coughs> and they emerged at the beginning of the 13th century. So the Dominicans are founded in 1216, the Franciscans a few years earlier by St. Francis in, what, St. Dominic and St. Francis in 1209. Um, uh, in contrast, then, to the older uh, monastic orders that you might be familiar with, like the Benedictines, uh, who were, at, by this point, uh, these very wealthy established order living in big, rich monasteries and things like that, uh, the mendicants did not remain within their cloisters. They actually wandered all around the world preaching, teaching, and confronting poverty. Shaheen has a comment or question. It's a, it's a question. I was just wondering, um, given the time during which these, uh, the, these orders emerged, um, do you think there might have been some influence from their interaction with Sufi orders in, during the Crusades? <laughs> 
That's possible. Um, so yeah, the question is that since g given the fact that the 13th century here is, um, you know, they've already been in contact with, uh, there's been a lot of interaction for, from the medieval wa Latin West now with Islam, both on the frontiers in Spain, in, in Sicily, and then in the, in the Crusader states in the Levant. And would, for example, the fact that there are wandering Sufi mystics, um, would that have had any, um, would that have inspired Francis, who is sort of a mystic? And so the Franciscans occasionally did. Um, the, the, the thing I would say uh, kind of against it is that um, it's surprisingly, uh, so the, there's this huge interaction between the cultures in Spain, you know, where people are actually listening to each other and Western scholars are going down and, and getting um, uh, medieval Arabic texts and, and, and vice versa. There's this cultural exchange. It's amazing how much they are not learning from each other over in the, in the war zone of the Crusader states. <laughs> And so even though the locals over there are um, assimilating, and you would, I think we might easily say that the Templars and the Hospitallers, which is to say these militant, um, new militant monastic orders, may have a lot more interaction as these guys that are local there, go a little go, go native, as we might say. I, I, I don't know anything that would connect the Franciscans and the Dominicans to that. Um, rather, I think that it, one of the things that may be happening here is that there is a continual need for uh, uh, a kind of spiritual renewal that happens with the different monastic orders in um, Western Christendom. So the Benedictines at one point or other did represent, you know, this idea of they have vows of poverty, they commit to essentially um, being religious, what the definition of that meant was that they are the people that are on the front lines for as far as the Christians are concerned in terms of the praying and all this kind of thing that is, uh, uh, that is keeping that society cohesive. But because they have had so much, quickly what happens is, is once you have something that is quite popular in terms of its spiritual power, so people like go there to the relics, they get healed and all those kind of things, they end up donating a lot to that uh, order, especially for example, when you die, so people, uh, it's very easy when you die to leave your money if you're, you know, if you don't have any descendants or something like that, you leave all your property to some monastery or to leave a little portion of your property to the monastery. When you do that, then it doesn't take long for the monastery to become extremely rich. And so then when it's rich, because money has this way of being non-spiritual, <laughs> um, the rich orders are very comfortable. And so then this, this need to have somebody at the spiritual front lines confronting things like poverty and living and ascetic life and all those kind of things emerges. And so again and again and again. So like we have here, I'm mentioning here the Franciscans and the Dominicans. In the meantime, there's already been um, uh, uh, the Cistercians and the, and the Carthusians who were um, the new orders of the 12th century you know, after the, after the Benedictines had grown fat, right? And so essentially the, 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 the Cistercians had then accomplished that in that middle period, and now those guys have also got rich houses, you know, and so now there's Franciscans and Dominicans. And it doesn't ultimately take too long for the Dominicans to have a lot of money too, you know, and all this kind of thing. And Franciscans too, even though they're really much more committed to poverty. So the Franciscans are, try to maintain it by, um, by making the legal pretext that they don't own any of their own property uh, and they own no property, uh, but people donate money to the order which is then owned by the Pope directly. <laughs> and then the Franciscans have use of it, which is almost no different from being rich. <laughs> you know? And so anyway, so that's, uh, that's one of the things that happened. So anyway, these new orders, right? So these new orders that are at the front lines then in the uh, 13th century uh, of preaching, teaching, and also in living aesthetic lives. Um, it also then, the new orders also quickly were a magnet for the best thinkers as people wanted to be involved in the place where all of the, the spiritual energy was. And so in this period of the 13th and 14th centuries, like the whole list of the superstars here from Albert the Great, Albus, Albertus Magnus, to Roger Bacon, to Bonaventure, to Thomas Aquinas, to Duns Scotus and William of Ockham. They're all coming from either the Dominican order, in the case of Albertus Magus, uh, and, uh, Magnus and Thomas Aquinas, or, or the Franciscan order in the case of the other ones, including Ockham. Another thing that's happening um, simultaneously or a little bit earlier um, is that uh, the Middle Ages is where we have the idea of the university that we still have today in the West. 
uh, universities developed in the Middle Ages out of cathedral schools. Their founding corresponded then with uh, the rediscovery of Aristotle for the West. So the um, Greeks in the East, who could of course still read Greek, um, always had access to Aristotle, as did uh, medieval uh, Muslims and Jews. And so it uh, had already been largely, Aristotle had lar already been largely assimilated over the last few centuries um, by uh, Muslim and Jewish theologians. But now, like I mentioned in Spain, um, the Latin, people in the Latin West started you know, accessing all of these texts. And simultaneously, they're accessing them with um, all of the Arabic uh, commentaries. And so essentially, as uh, Avicenna, as the Arab Arabes have come to terms with these Muslim thinkers, have come to terms with Aristotle, you know, at, within the context of an Abrahamic religion, albeit a different one than Christianity, uh, and as also Jewish thinkers, um, the Christians are able to say, oh, okay, well, if, you know, the Muslims were able to handle this this way, <laughs> you know, that we can try to figure this thing out and wrestle this ourselves. Uh, and so that's one of the major programs in the agenda of medieval philosophers uh, was then reconciling Aristotle's ideas as they have start getting dumped into the, uh, the thought pool of the Middle Ages with the, the tradition that they'd inherited, which was largely based on Plato. So Platonism uh, that the West had inherited through the prism of St. Augustine. So Augustine, who is writing at the end of uh, antiquity in the Roman, before the Roman Empire's collapse in the West, um, largely makes Platonism or a reformed kind of Platonism as the central kind of uh, metaphysics of Christian, Western Christian theology. All right, so that becomes known then in the Middle Ages, as that develops, as the universities develop, that becomes known as scholasticism, which ultimately, um, by the time of the Enlightenment and things like that, for later thinkers, Renaissance thinkers, scholasticism becomes an, uh, a, an ugly word, a critical word, because they look back on uh, the people in the Middle Ages and they want to draw a big line between uh, the present day and them. But at the first point, it, doesn't, it isn't anything negative uh, at this time. Uh, the word scholasticism comes from the fact that it is uh, the teaching that evolved out of these medieval schools, the universities. And so it is the philosophical method in the medieval universities, and this particular method of learning focuses on uh, dialectical reasoning, and so, which is to say, a um, particular kind of logic. So uh, the medieval universities, uh, again, based on the Western uh, Latin curriculum that has been preserved since the Roman Empire of the seven liberal arts, uh, the quadrivium, which are the applied sciences like geometry, arithmetic, music, astronomy, and then the trivium, which are the, um, uh, anyway, the grammar, rhetoric, and logic or dialectic. And so dialectic becomes the one that the medieval people just can't get enough of as soon as they get a hold of it. And so people who are, are um, more crazy about logic than any time. You don't expect that of the Middle, middle Ages, but in fact, that's when people really like my <laughs> logic, you know? And so anyway, dialectic. And so the idea of the way that they do it in the Central Middle Ages and the scholastic universities, it grows out of this idea of the Socratic method that we've talked about when we were doing, just, was it just last week that we talked about the Republic? I feel like that was a long time ago. <laughs> so, so yeah, as we talked about Plato's Republic, we talked about essentially how Socrates wanders around the, um, uh, the town of Athens and asks people uh, just seemingly innocuous questions. Well, what is justice? <laughs> he asks the different people and the people you know, give him different kinds of answers and then he's like, thinks about it. Hmm, I wonder what, what are the logical implications of that proposition, proposition that you're making? And then he ultimately pisses them all off as he proves uh, that they are asserting things that are contradictory or things that uh, are not what they want to say, right? And so essentially this idea of the Socratic method of examining big picture questions through asking questions and then having a dialogue, an exploration about it, um, like the Platonic dialogues that we have, that's kind of the basis of how to, scholasticism grows out of that. And so the goal of uh, scholastic philosophers is ultimately to um, resolve perceived contradictions in different um, in different authorities and things like that. So as the different people offer different definitions, you want to get at the, what's the essence here? And so um, we're just gonna show an example of how this works in the kind of the, um, 
don't know, the guy who's the, uh, the king of kings of all of the scholastic philosophers, so Thomas Aquinas. And so Thomas Aquinas has this uh, enormous book, you know, the Summa Theologiae, which is uh, the sum of theologies, <laughs> the sum of theology, and it's laid out uh, in the format. Every single one of his different arguments is laid out in this <coughs> format. So it goes, number one, the question. So we start with this question. Two, we bring up all the objections that people have, the authorities, what authorities say that object to that uh, question. Uh, then we say, um, on the contrary, so people who um, object to the objectors, <laughs> you know, on the contrary. Then we hear what Aquinas has to say or whatever the scholastic guy has to say on it. So he responds to this uh, uh, dialectical, this dialogue that he has had by assembling the authorities. And then uh, we, we hear at the end kind of a reply to all of those objections we listed off in number two. So how the replies um, figure into essentially the, uh, the philosopher's uh, overall response and idea. And we're going to go through an example of this from the Summa Theologiae, which unfortunately I think is probably going to make you guys not ever want to read it, <laughs> read the book. But I picked this particular example because this, this particular question that um, Aquinas asks is one that's just totally relevant to the topic. And so um, that we have of Occam's razor, and so we'll go through it, uh, try to go through it. You, it's going to be a little bit of a slog, so follow me through this slog as we <laughs> you know, make our way through Thomas Aquinas and his, uh, the way he reasons here in, in the scholastics. Okay, um, so Aquinas here is going to have, let's say, he takes in the first part of uh, uh, the Summa Theologiae in question number 15, the question is whether there are ideas. So the question they're going to retreat, uh, they're, that we're going to treat here is uh, whether ideas exist, whether there are ideas. And so that's the first, that's part one, the question, right? And then we're going to have objections. On the contrary, I respond that, and then we're going to have the replies to the objections. So whether there are ideas, objection number one, he writes, this is all quote, quoting uh, Aquinas now. It seems that there are no ideas. So this is the objection to the question that their ideas exist. For Dionysius says, and in this case we're talking about Pseudo-Dionysius the Areopagite. Do you need Ivan? Do you want? Ivan. Okay. I just wondered if he was talking of the Plato's ideas. Yes. Or he's talking of yeah, Our Jane. Sort of idea. Yeah, yeah. Ideas. Jane has Jane has you know, already seen seen what he's talking about here. Oh. So so Jane is like saying so when we're even having here the question whether there are ideas, the word ideas here is for um, like you say forms. So the idea the, whether the forms exist as we have been looking at them whenever we cover Plato like we did last week. So the question is whether the forms are real is kind of what this question is. And so the first objection here is, it seems that there are no forms, that the forms are not real is another way we might write this. For Dionysius says, and then he just quotes where that is coming from as an authority, that God does not know things by ideas. And then, okay, so, so that's the, an objection to that. But ideas are for nothing else except that they may be known through them. So the whole point of the forms is that, uh, that we're going to be able to know, you know the forms. So if there is a form of justice, the whole point of having a form of justice is so that we can know justice as a result of that form's real existence, right? And so anyway, therefore there are no ideas. So in other words, because if God um, uh, does not know things by ideas, and that's what ideas are for, then this is a problem as far as um, an objection at, as we're starting and looking at these authorities. And this is going to all be, we don't have to, you don't have to get every last one of these things, <laughs> you know, but I'm just going to kind of just show you um, why um, I think later thinkers don't like scholastics, <laughs> you know, but anyway. <laughs> objection number two. Further, God knows all things in himself as has already been said, so that was one of the previous questions, question number 14, but uh, he does not know himself through an idea, therefore, uh, and neither therefore other things. So 
um, because um, God isn't dependent on platonic forms in order to uh, know God's self, so God is, you know, is, doesn't require that kind of thing for God's knowledge anyway, um, neither therefore does God require anything um, in order to know anything, right? And so this is a problem with the idea of the forms. Once we have at attached onto it, for example, this Christian idea of an omnipotent, omniscient God. And so that's what we're doing here in, in this theological treatise, right? So that's another objection then. Uh, further, <coughs> this is objection number three, further, an idea is considered to be the principle of knowledge and action, but the divine essence, so God's own essence, is a sufficient principle of knowing and affecting all things. So God is omniscient and omnipotent, and so therefore that's all you need once you just have defined God that way. So we don't need forms in order to understand uh, God's knowing anything or God's doing anything. Uh, it is not therefore necessary to suppose ideas. So we don't need to um, create hypothetical forms because we already have an omnipotent and omniscient God and is, as we he talked about above this. Is that all a little clear? I don't know. <laughs> so essentially you can see the idea here is that we took that original question, are there forms, are there ideas, do uh, Plato's forms have reality, and we've listed objections to why we might argue that they don't, and that's part of the dialectical process. Rudy has a question or comment. Uh, when you say forms, do you mean uh, material reality, objects? So. So we mean reality, but not material reality. So immaterial reality. So we might remember when we did the, it's really tough for us in, in our modern era because we largely um, philosophically are what we sometimes call radical materialists where we think that only, we even use this in our phrasing, you know, what matters, when we ask about what matters, the word right in there is matter, right? And so we really think of matter as mattering. And if we're thinking about something that's immaterial, we say, well, this is simply immaterial, <laughs> right? And so uh, the idea here, though, for Plato, as we saw, we'll, we'll talk about it again here, but anyway, with the allegory of the cave is that, in fact, the cave, you know, with the shadow play that's on the walls, that's the material world, and the material world is just the shadow play that is so much less real than the immaterial world in Platonism. And so when we're talking about these um, uh, forms, we are talking about things that have true existence in Plato, but that's not material existence. It's beyond material. Okay, um, anyway, so those are the objections. That's how, this is the first two steps then of how this scholasticism I'm works. I'm not sure if I know what I'm talking about here. <laughs> we have to get, we have to, you have to talk to the mic because people are watching the stream. There, um, without trying to think that through, uh, there's a some assumption that I can just tap into God's knowledge and God will then have me not molesting children. And of course, what we see in the real world, I'm just, I, you know, I've gone to extreme, but I mean, yeah. just, I, that, like God is going to take care of it. And is, uh, am I getting that there's something, so there's something that God knows, but I don't know what God knows, so I would yeah. have to go through the process of ideas, would I not? Well, so I, I guess we're going to get to that kind of a practical application. We have a whole bunch of other things, you know, where this is really kept, uh, this is really cordoned off into just talking about God and eternal forms. To actually get into the point where, where we understand, let's say, how we can know a thing, so how can we know what either God knows or how can we know the forms, it's a whole bunch of other levels of, of the questions. But in fact, that is one of the core um, core ideas of the ideas of Plato's forms is that the way um, you know anything like right and wrong, like for example, the idea that it's wrong to molest children, you know, is that we have a sense of, let's say, what is good, and you're participating in, in what is good, which is to say that form, and so then that's how you actually even know what's good or not, is because that form exists in reality somewhere, but not in the material world, and you as a material person are able to participate in that somehow. And so that's the problem. If, like you say, um, and what, why are all the people who, who, we have to then explain why are people who 
aren't able to participate in that, you know, in, in terms of doing something that does seem so manifestly wrong, even if they maybe are profess religion or any other thing. Does that make any sense? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, well, I'm just saying that what we see is that it has to be entered into the conversation. It has to be out there sharing what principles we have so that those things don't happen. We can't just leave it hidden. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I think it's important to remember that Thomas Aquinas was a philosopher, and in philosophy, the point is not to be able to apply it in practical application t to human life. Uh, once something becomes too practical, it falls out of the realm of philosophy. So philosophy usually tries to think about larger <laughs> ideas, like the theory of the forms, <coughs> rather than how we interact with the form or how we can obtain the form. And, and so we'll just say that that's this, this very highly theoretical part of this, especially, um, whether or not then, so he is a, a, as a theologian, he is also part of a church, and the church also is li existing in, a, in the real world, I mean, in the physical world, and so therefore has to uh, come to grips with actual very practical applications. But in the theological treatise, treatise here, the philosophical treatise here, it's, it's quite esoteric in that sense. Uh, Jane had a point, and then we'll move on. Say it again, Jane. But it's because of his being a theologian that he happens to know the mind of God. <laughs> well, it's um, it's based on. I mean, I would say that. Why you know does Aquinas know the mind of God? <laughs> you know, I think he would he would express a lot of humility. <laughs> um, but what he's doing is he is um, he believe what he believes is, and I think he he thinks that there we have a a capacity to say a lot of things about the mind of God based on. Um, some, some, some quite sophisticated philosophical reasoning that leads us to those conclusions. So logic is going to take us some of the way there. And some, I think that that's how he's thinking about it. And as you say, as a th because he's a theologian. The last sentence, who is he referring to? Okay, so let's read the last one again. So um, further an idea, which is to say, this is when we're talking about the theory of forms. The theory of forms, it, the idea is considered to be the principle of knowledge and action. But the divine essence is a f sufficient principle of knowing and affecting all things. It is not therefore necessary to suppose ideas. That means philosophers need not suppose these ideas because we've already just said essentially, this is like one of these things, multiplying hypotheses. So the theory of forms is a theory, right? Where Plato has essentially asserted um, that uh, these uh, real, uh, that ju things like justice or, or uh, love or goodness have real metaphysical existence that's not physical, right? And so that's a, an argument that he makes and, he, and, and by doing that argument, there are all sorts of consequences to it and benefits to it and, uh, and problems to it. But essentially by making that, you are doing this thing, when we're talking about Occam's razor, uh, you know, you, by, when you start multiplying these kind of hypotheses, then you, you start to have a very complicated idea for how the whole universe works. And so what he's suggesting here, almost at the end of it, is um, he's almost appealing to Occam's razor, which is to say, given the fact that we already have proved earlier in the Summa Theologiae that um, God exists and that God is omniscient and omnipotent, we therefore have sufficient um, hypotheses already proved uh, for the way that God would know and do things, right? So we don't need to suppose this other thing of Plato's entire theory of forms. And so by, by this, who is this referring to in the last sentence? It's not necessary for, lot, for philosophers or theologians to create this extra hypothesis. Okay, we're gonna slog forward. I know that I promised you guys that this is uh, slog through a swamp and it really is, but anyway, <laughs> we'll just keep it up. Okay, so we had then what some of the different authorities have said against um, the theory of forms. But on the contrary, Augustine, so now when we're talking about authorities, we brought out the big guns, so if Augustine's gonna say something, boom, let's see what he says, you know. <laughs> Augustine says, such is the power inherent in ideas, in other words, in, fo in the forms, that no one can be wise unless they are understood. <laughs> so Augustine is all in with Plato, <laughs> you know, and so he says, you know, so put all the chips on the table. So, okay, so against all the authorities that we just barely read, um, Augustine now says, nope, you gotta go back to forms, there's something going on here. Um, okay, and so this is then uh, what Aquinas then has to say, having marshaled, you know, this essentially doing 
Um, when in history we call this like our historiography. How is this topic treated by past historians? Now how are you objecting, in this case philosophers? So how did past uh, authorities treat this and now how do I respond? I respond, uh, which is to say Aquinas answers that it is necessary to suppose the forms, to suppose ideas in the divine mind. So we have to um, uh, take Plato's theory of forms and then we have to understand them as Augustine did as being existing within the divine mind, God's mind. For the Greek word idea is in Latin forma, so essentially we're talking here about the forms. Hence, by ideas uh, are understood the forms of things existing apart from the things themselves. So that we have all of these different things, but things, each of them have a form. That form exists apart from the things. Um, now the form of anything existing apart from the form, I'm sorry, apart from the thing itself, can be for one of two ends. Either to be the type of that which is called the form, or to be the principle of the knowledge of that thing, inasmuch as the forms of things are knowable, uh, forms of things knowable are said to be in him who knows them. In either case, we must suppose forms, the ideas, as is clear from the following reasons. So essentially, there's two different kinds of things that we're going to have, the reasons why we have. One is that the form, you know, is the type. You know, essentially, um, if you're going to make a, a, a stamper, uh, and you're going to stamp out uh, license plates or something, and you go chunk, uh, and the one thing you know on the one side or any other things that you stamp is the, there's the form and the type and the anti-type, right? So essentially, something that is making the impression, and then something uh, that you know, which is to say, the, the ethereal, eternal form that is the of the actual thing, and then you have the material thing that is essentially representing that uh, that type, right? So that's like a chair, the idea of chair, then all the chairs you guys are sitting in. Um, or, and so it's either that thing, or the principle of knowledge of that thing. So, uh, uh, and so, and, we'll, and he's going to explain what he means by that in the next <laughs> little bit, so let's go forward. So, in all things not generated by chance, the form must be the end of any generation whatsoever. But an agent does not act on account of the form, except insofar as the likeness of the form is the agent, as may happen in two ways. In the agent. <laughs> in the agent. In the agent. Where did I write it? Where did I read it? In the agent. I'm sorry. Except insofar as the likeness of the form is in the agent. Yeah, right. Okay, exactly. As may happen in two ways. Okay. For in some agents, the form of the thing to be made pre-exists according to its natural being as in those that act by their nature, as when man generates a man. Human generates a human. Actually, you need a woman to do it, right? <laughs> so essentially, with the idea of it is um, chickens have give birth and make more chickens. So then that, the idea of it is that the person that's acting there is the form acting on itself, right? Or fire generates fire. Whereas in other agents, the form of the thing to be made pre-exists according to intelligible being, as in those that act by the intellect, and thus the likeness of a house pre-exists in the minds of a builder. So the idea of the form is a plan. So either the thing is uh, reproducing itself, or there's a mental conception, an intelligible conception that is then being brought into being by a different kind of agent. This is real complicated stuff. But anyway, <laughs> we, this is, we're doing forms, even though the forms are the hardest thing there is, because it's critically important to what Occam is gonna do. <laughs> so, okay, finally, and then he concludes in his response here. And this may be called, I mean, so in other words, the, the plan that exists that the builder is making, the, this plan that it may be called the idea of the house. So the form of the house existed before the builder got going. Since the builder intends to build his house like to the form conceived in his mind, as then the world was not made by chance, but by God acting by his intellect, as will appear later, he's gonna prove that later, <laughs> there must exist in the divine mind a form to the likeness of which the world was made, and in this, the notion of an, an idea consists. <laughs> so we therefore, as far as he's concerned, in order to have all of the different things, for example, that we have in terms of having a physical world, there has to have been 
uh, eternal forms in the mind of God in order to now actually have physical things be there. And so as far as he's concerned, uh, that proves it. <laughs> Okay, so this is, this is Aquinas' anyway, defense of Plato's theory of forms as uh, that was adapted by Plotinus and later Augusta. So and then we go, just to finish out the scholastic method here, we go back to these objections, or we remember them, they don't repeat them, but you, can, you look back in the text of what they were. We might remember that first objection from uh, Pseudo-Dionysius the Areopagite, that God does not know things by ideas, but ideas are for nothing else except that they may be known through them, therefore there are no ideas, that's essentially the idea, uh, that objection. The reply to that objection is, God does not understand things according to an idea existing outside of himself, thus Aristotle rejects the opinion of Plato who held the ideas existed of themselves and not in the intellect. So essentially this modification of Plato's original idea, we're, we're rejecting that part of Plato's idea and instead have now um, taken that refinement of the idea of the forms from Aristotle and again from, uh, from Plotinus and ultimately Augustine uh, where essentially the ideas, Plato's uh, forms, are said to then be uh, ideas in the mind of God. Valerie. Might, might part of the problem be that if ideas were to exist outside uh, the mind of God, then the question would arise, where did they come from? Did God create them? Right. Yes, so that would be definitely a problem in Christian theology if, if Augustine hadn't resolved this by sticking all the ideas inside God. Because if the ideas were all outside of God, anything that would exist outside of, anything that exists outside of God that's eternal um, would be God as far as Christian theology is concerned, because God is the only uncreated eternal thing, and so anything else that would be eternal and uncreated, in other words, if something is, a, is an eternal form, um, that would itself be God, and so in order to make that, you know, like in the same way that in Christian theology is already complicated enough in the idea that the Creator, Christ, and the Holy Spirit are all God and uncreated, right? Um, and so if you started having all of the forms out there too, all being God, that would be really complicated. So instead, they all got inside God, which is to say in the mind of God. Yes. So one of Thomas Aquinas's other uh, arguments was when he was considering the existence of God, he talks about uh, whether it's better to have uh, something exist in your mind alone or something to have existed in your mind and in reality at the same time. And yes. they essentially come up with that it's better to exist in your mind and in reality. So yes. if you work your way backwards, uh, if it exists in reality, therefore it must have existed in someone's mind. So if we exist, therefore we must have existed in God's mind first. Otherwise God would have a creator and somebody created him. Right. <laughs> and so uh, we can imagine then that part of this whole issue, um, if we're gonna have another uh, lecture in about a couple months here, uh, which is, um, why do angels dance on pinheads? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know where, where we're going to talk about, like, essentially, um, you know, again, this era of the Middle Ages when they are really excited about um, logic and dialectic. And so, therefore, they come to all kinds of conclusions about existence um, that are, you know, based on ontological and other kinds of arguments, arguments of from being um, that we're not necessarily convinced nowadays, you know, um, get, get us all the way to physical real world existence once you're talking about, let's say, from ideas and, and things like that, but it was quite right, right at the heart of what they believed back then. So that's the first objection. The second objection we remember uh, had been God knows all things in himself, uh, but he does not know himself through an idea. Uh, neither therefore other things, so God doesn't need, I, doesn't need the forms in order to know himself or therefore anything. And a reply then to that now is, although God knows himself and all else by his own essence, yet his essence is the operative principle of all things except of himself. It, is therefore, it has therefore the nature of an idea with respect to other things, though not with respect to himself. <laughs> And so essentially, what the, 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 objection, the original objection here was, we don't want to make God dependent on, uh, on eternal forms, but because we stuck him inside God, it's okay because then God isn't dependent on the ideas. 
but the ideas uh, themselves, everything else is dependent on them because they're from God, right? So that's how he gets out of that one. And then finally, further, an idea is considered to be the principle of knowledge and action, but the divine essence is sufficient principle of knowing and affecting all things. It is therefore not necessarily to, necessary to suppose ideas. God's omniscient, omnipotent, so therefore he doesn't need uh, platonic ideas in order to, platonic forms in order to do and know things. Um, the reply is, God is the similitude of all things according to his essence. Therefore, an idea in God is identical with his essence. And so, again, we've successfully stuck the ideas, the platonic forms inside God, and so uh, uh, all is well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so scholasticism, what's not to love? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so there we are. Uh, and so thank you for putting up with that. That's the toughest part of the whole lecture. <laughs> so, uh, Yvonne, it's got a comment or question. <laughs> uh, maybe just uh, to uh, make a, a brief defense of scholasticism, <laughs> the Middle Ages was an age of faith, yes. capital A, capital F. Uh, I think Aquinas would have said, philosophy is the handmaid of theology. Theology is the queen of the sciences, yes. of things uh, that are demonstrably and irrefutably true. Yes. And some of those things are true uh, by faith. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and, and so I'm not, yeah, I'm not attempting to poo-poo them that. I mean, but the, I also just point out, though, that where did he get this idea that um, uh, theology is the queen of the sciences? You know, this is, um, this is from Aristotle. So Aristotle uh, taught that sciences are in a hierarchy, and that in some cases, um, uh, lesser sciences are dependent on previous sciences, so the top science is theology. And so the idea of it is, if you can prove something then in, in the science of theology, then that will be true in the lesser dependent ones when you get down to them. Uh, and, so, um, and so Aquinas is obviously uh, an amazingly, um, like you say, he's an amazing, he's a person who's devoted his entire life uh, to um, the re religious convictions. And indeed, at the end of his life, uh, having been possibly one of the most brilliant people that have ever, you know, it certainly existed in all of history, and certainly in the Middle Ages, um, he, having uh, had this, having been just amazingly prolific. So we went through this, like, this thing, it took us forever to slog through, frankly. It took me, I had to read it a zillion times to get what he's saying. He is, he is simply dictating um, that faster than scribes could write things down, and he has multiple scribes, like three scribes around him, uh, because they can't write as fast as he is saying this stuff. <laughs> and so it's just coming out of his head because he's so, um, such a brilliant logician. And yet, you know, at the end of his life, um, uh, he has uh, so turned to um, mysticism and how, uh, and this kind of, uh, mystical or ecstatic vision of knowing the divine that it, as far as he's concerned everything that he's written is as straw <laughs> compared to um, uh, what the, that that ultimate experience and so and so we shouldn't on the one hand um, discount the amount of focus that they actually have on logic and philosophy and everything like that but then they're also like you say it's an age of faith okay I like scholasticism actually but <laughs> anyway but it is a tough slug Okay, so um, <coughs> as you guys are already aware, we already even just talked about it at the beginning of this instead of at the end, um, there, this is a defense of the forms, right? And so this is a defense of Plato's allegory of, uh, I'm sorry, the forms as was, we've read about in the allegory of the cave. And so again, this idea is the sensible world is like a shadow play, the world of our senses compared to the intellectible world. And so, um, just because we're so far removed from this, but this is where they were at very seriously in the center, in, from Plato's time and all through the center of the Middle Ages. Um, these ideas of universals, these ideas of the forms, the ideas, they aren't just uh, conceptions. They're not just simply something that we conceive of. For Plato and his successors here all through the Middle Ages, they're objective realities that we can't see with the eyes of the body or physical eyes, but it's because they're not part of the sensible world but they're only available to us to our mind's eye, uh, where we see them or perceive them 
they're intelligible because they are, um, and it's not simply the brain, it's, um, it's uh, the eye of the soul, right? And so the mental eye that sees the forms is not simply, um, we think of the brain, everything as being brain, it's not simply reasoning, but rather intelligibility is perception employing intuition, intellectual intuition, and contemplation. And so that's the way they're seeing uh, forms and universals at this time. Okay, going back all the way to Plato when Plato is coming up with this, um, the idea, and so same with Socrates, his, his predecessor and teacher, um, the argument put forward by Socrates in the Republic and possibly in real life before that, uh, or the forms then have this existence, as I mentioned, uh, not physical, but real, and their meaning can be known and communicated. So um, on the one hand, they have real existence. We can participate in that and know it to some extent, although not obviously to the full extent. Um, we, Plato uses the analogy of the sun, where the ultimate form, the form of the good, is like um, uh, the sunlight that is both uh, warming us and um, you know, allowing us to perceive light and see things in general, uh, but that we can't actually look directly at it, or you know, that we'd blind our eyes in the same exact way. We aren't really looking directly at um, these forms, but they can be known to an extent, especially through analogy and allegory, and they can also then be communicated. So part of the whole idea of the allegory of the cave is that when the philosopher has gotten out of the, the cave and the uh, the world of shadows that is our physical reality that we see around us and has seen the true light, one of the things that you feel obliged to do, even though you don't want to, is to go back into the cave and talk to the other fellow prisoners in order to communicate that idea of what you've seen to them so that they can also be freed from their uh, mental shackles uh, of the physical convention around them. So, so that's what they're arguing here. In contrast, their contemporaries um, who Plato and Aristotle call the sophists, although it becomes, they're using that as an antagonistic term. Uh, the sophists, uh, including a guy named Gorgias, argued, um, we have very few fragments, but one of the fragments is almost exactly this. There is no essential meaning to anything. So in contrast to the forms which are about essential meaning. So when Socrates is arguing what is justice, he thinks that you can actually come up with something, there is something that exists in, in reality that is what justice is. Uh, but to Gorgias says there's no essential meaning to anything. Two, if there were, it would be unknowable. So if there is some kind of uh, beyond our mortal realm, uh, big picture, big idea, knowledge, we can't know that um, so much more so than you just can't just look at the sun. There's just no way that that's gonna be able to be understood by our uh, mortal brains. And then three, if it were known, if you actually did get that in your head somehow, you would not be able to communicate it to anybody else. And so essentially it's a trifold um, pessimism about um, having any kind of meaning, uh, knowing any, any meaning and communicating any meaning. That would be very different from other contemporaries back then at the time in, in ancient Greece, which were simply skeptics and we'll just mention. So sometimes when you're hearing that kind of sophist denial, the denials of the sophists of those kind of uh, what Plato and Aristotle are saying, you think, well, they're just being skeptical. But skeptics, in fact, um, would have a, a different position. It wouldn't be um, positing a negative knowledge, you know, or negative ideas that, you know, in other words, we, that we can't know. Rather, um, a, a true skeptic would uh, doubt that we can accept Plato and Socrates' arguments. In other words, this. This argument, you can say, well, it's a great idea, but I don't think we have the proof based on all the things that you said, Socrates and Plato, in order to get that. But they would also doubt that we have enough evidence to agree with the sophists that all the things are relative. So you have to, you know, the idea of a true skepticism would be to withhold on both of those. Does that make sense? <laughs> got it. I got there eventually. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So next, we're just going to do, you know, because this is also then part of the inheritance and is also the, 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 um, the most important, kind of the, the recent part of the inheritance in the Middle Ages. We mentioned that uh, uh, in the medieval <coughs> West, in the universities, it's these uh, medieval philosophers who are recovering Aristotle and now having to integrate that into medieval Western thought. And so Aristotle um, is this great creator of logical systems. So he systemized everything, he creates hierarchies and categories and everything like that. 
both of logic and also systemization. And those things are things that medieval people loved. <laughs> so there's nothing more, you know, they, like I mentioned already, they love logic. They also love to put everything into a system. And so if you have a, um, if you can make it a chart and everything has a, this thing, that's, that's gold. <laughs> and so Aristotle does that. And so in uh, his categories, Aristotle lists all the possible kinds of things that can be the subject or predicate of any object. So as we're trying to describe any particular object like this particular podium, me, particular John Hamer speaker here, and this kind of thing, um, how, what can be said of me as a subject or a predicate? And then how can we, and then he then takes those kinds of things and groups them into 10 categories that he considers irreducible. So these essentially we could, we could have made, uh, we could divide them up into bigger subcategories and things like that, but at this point we just need 10 different um, kinds of categories to group all the things that we need to do logically to describe me as an object and me separate from this podium as an object. And so what are those categories, the 10 categories that Aristotle gives us? And so first are substance, and those are your substances like you, that you're a podium, <laughs> You're a human, and specifically, you can also have a substance being John Hamer, my particular substance. Quantity, okay, so these are, by the way, these are all the examples that Aristotle actually gives. So I, they're not always, a, I might have thought a better example. <laughs> but anyway, we just went ahead with the ones that he gives so I don't, so I don't mess it up. So he essentially says four-footed or five-footed, if, if you're looking at a particular animal, that would be the quantity uh, of that. The quality would be whether, um, the thing that you're talking about is, let's say, white, or whether it has a knowledge of grammar, whether it can give a uh, philosophy lecture more or less good, or kind of at least passingly good, <laughs> you know, or something like that. Uh, four, relatives. Um, ha is it, let's say, double size, half, or larger than anything? Is it taller than the podium? <laughs> or something like that. In other words, how is it relative to other things? Um, it's somewhereness. <laughs> Is it here in Toronto Center Place? Is it at the Aristotle's Lyceum? Is it over in the marketplace? It has a quality, I mean, it has a category of somewhereness. It has a category of sometimeness. So um, some object may well be in moving all around everywhere and we can say that that particular one exists. Uh, it exists in somewhere, but it doesn't exist in somewhere permanently or forever, but it, let's say at a particular time like yesterday. Being in a position. Is it, is it standing? Is it sitting? Is it lying down? Having, is it have its shoes on? <laughs> is it wearing <laughs> armor? Uh, what are the th sort of things that it has? Acting, is it actively cutting something? Is it actively burning? What is it actively doing? And then is it being acted upon? Is it being cut? Is it being burnt? And so we need all of those kind of 10 categories of things, Aristotle thinks logically, in order to describe any particular uh, thing. And so each one of these different categories then also um, has to have then a metaphysical reality uh, like the form, so like the idea of justice. And so therefore um, this category of, let's say, of, of speaking or giving a lecture, the acting category, you know, is something that then um, is one of these things that has essentially a metaphysical reality and all of the different objects that we can describe that are, let's say, currently right now giving lectures somewhere, or let's say at some time have, or in some place, you know, that's some, one of these qualities or metaphysical qualities of the same way as, let's say, greenness or something like that, right? Okay, so Occam so is, has, has inherited <coughs> then those categories. We're already several centuries into um, the medieval assimilation <laughs> of Aristotle and going, trying to figure out what it's going on. And so, um, as we re remember, when we talked about how um, o William of Ockham formulated the principle of parsimony, so, you know, uh, when we talked about his, the way he quotes that for um, uh, the Ockham's razor idea, it was plurality must never be posited <laughs> without necessity. And now that we have started to see, by looking at Plato and Aristotle, um, we've started to see uh, how they make a lot of use of, let's say, metaphysical plurality. You know, so Aristotle here has just given us 10 different kind of metaphysical categories to describe objects, right? So to Occam, Aristotle's argument here seems unnecessarily complex. 
Do we really need to posit 10 different categories of things in order to define an object? So in Occam's view, this is plurality that has been posited without necessity. So now we're going to get into some Occam razor action. <laughs> so oh, you can all wake up, it's going to be active and exciting now. <laughs> so here we go. So what happens? Uh-oh, here's the razor. <laughs> you know? And so what do, what do we need here and what don't we need? And so as far as Occam and his razor is going to be concerned, whammo, we do not need all of that. So just <laughs> cut that all out. So Occam argues actually the only necessary categories we have are substance and quality. So we don't need all of these ways of defining these into different kinds of uh, categories. So let's look at how he would do it then. So let's say we got this red balloon. So to um, reference then the particular red balloon here, we only need to have to talk about the particular balloon itself, its substance, and then we can talk about its various qualities. They can all just be counted as qualities. So its redness, its being full of healingness, heliumness, <laughs> It's existing in a particular place, a particular time, and all those kind of things. Those are all just qualities to the substance, right? As far as um, Occam is concerned. So in so doing, though, we don't have to posit categories such as balloonness or redness that this particular balloon is participating in. So it is simply a, a quality of the balloon that is red, not that it is as a balloon particular participating in redness the same as all other red objects are, as we would have understand it in Aristotle or Plato. So it's simply a quality of, um, of the red balloon, the particular balloon. So here's what he has to say on the topic. There is no universal, there is no, the forms essentially, forms, there's no, forms don't exist outside the mind, really existing in individual substances or in the essence of things. So, there, so we, inside our minds, we maybe are, are getting the idea of redness, but redness doesn't, in Occam's opinion, have an existence outside, uh, I'm sorry, out, outside of our minds that is existing inside those substances like that balloon. So there's no redness as an actual metaphysical substance that is existing in the balloon. Uh, and it's not part of then the essence of balloon or balloonness or in the essence, right? So it's just a particular thing. The reason is that everything that is not many things is necessarily one thing in number and consequently a singular thing. It is just a one balloon. <laughs> it is not a balloon that is filled up with that is filled up with all of these different metaphysical substances like redness and full of heliumness and being not right here ness because it was only on the screenness, you know, and all this kind of thing. So, okay, so this is a serious then metaphysical house cleaning uh, that Occam is really trying to do. So he's razoring down then from ten uh, categories to two, and that's big. Um, he's also then able to reduce. Uh, past the character, I'm sorry, the categories that Aristotle felt believed were irreducible by arguing then that the qualities are themselves then not universal. And so therefore, like we said, the red balloon is not participating in the universal, universal qualities. It has its own real existence, that have their own real existences. It is simply a particular object with qualities that we then give the name red. So it's not participating in the universal quality of redness. We, it just simply has a characteristic that we observe in our minds and we then give it a name, red, not, not a universal redness. And so that brings us to the name essentially of Occam's uh, philosophy here, which is nominalism. So rather than participating as people had, a, had followed in both the Aristotelian and Platonic traditions in universal categories, Occam here is arguing that qualities like redness, like being red, think, painting things red, that's just a name that we've given it. And in Latin, uh, the word names, names means is nomina in Latin, and so that gives us the name to Occam's philosophy, which is nominalism. So it's just to say, all these things that we have thought of as intrinsic essences, as universal forms, are just names. So this rejection of universals, I'm sorry, of universals of Plato's forms, then, it revives, if we remember the sophists, if we go back to Gorgias, that revives essentially the first one of Gorgias's um, arguments and pessimism about knowing, right? So essentially the idea that nothing has essential meaning. There is no essential form, uh, as Plato would argue. So 
Uh, let's just look at then some of the theological consequences because <laughs> we don't often do here talk too much about theology. We tend to talk more about philosophy and history. But anyway, there's some interesting theological consequences of this. So we're going to talk a little bit about the consequences for philosophy, but the implications uh, for theology are also worthwhile, I think, to describe. So whereas Augustine, as we talked about, had synthesized Platonism and Christian theology by equating God with the good and by housing all those forms, as we talked about inside the divine mind, nominalism now assert, asserts that there are no forms uh, uh, in God's mind or anywhere. <laughs> as we've denied the idea that Plato's forms exist. So in contrast to what that whole long proof that Aquinas does, Occam's like, nope, there are no there are no forms, uh, because there aren't all these things inside one thing. A thing is just a thing. So in Occam's view, where does that lead Occam? So he doesn't like to multiply, needlessly multiply causes or hypotheses. So instead of having all of these different metaphysical explanations about why anything happens, uh, we don't need a bazillion causes like Aristotle likes to list all these different efficient causes and material causes and everything like that. As far as Occam's concerned, Everything is caused by its first cause. And what's the first cause? Can you imagine? God. God. <laughs> right? So, so essentially the ultimate cause. Yeah, Valerie. Um, so it seems that uh, he's kind of rejigging the etiology, the origin of things from being uh, caused by participation in the forms to being just directly caused by God. Uh, yes. Is that like a necessary move? That's what, he's, that's what he, whether digest, it's necessary or not, it's what it happens. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I think that you can understand it in terms of um, this idea of his, the, the Occam's razor. <laughs> so in other words, this idea of not wanting to multiply unnecessary hypotheses, you know, in order to get to the, your conclusion, right? And diminish so, God's potency. And that's the other big one right here, like you say. And, dimin and thereby diminish God's potency. And so this is then why um, his, his other, his theology is often called divine voluntarism. Um, and so, because again, he's focused in on this idea of God being defined as omnipotent, omniscient, and he asserts that God then commands various things. He, if, so, so if he was more or less arguing, if you do like Augustine and Aquinas, and you actually argue that, let's say, um, God uh, does all these various things that God does because they're inherently good, because we've equated God with the form of goodness itself, with the platonic form of the good, that would necessarily imply that there are limits to what God could do, <laughs> because it, it, God has to do good. <laughs> you know, because, so God is therefore not, uh, you know, not able to exercise divine will, as far as Occam is concerned. And so this is what we mean here by voluntarism, because the Latin word against for will is voluntas, right? So uh, uh, instead, Occam here then is arguing that God commands and does things that we call good in name, again, nominalism, we use the name good in order to describe what God does, uh, but we do that simply because God wills them. <laughs> and that's how we define uh, you know, what good is. And so it's not then because of any other, uh, any other thing. It's because of the divine will. You have a... Uh, 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 Pastor Hamer, could you re uh, return to the previous uh, slide? Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> okay. So essentially... There's this idea, <laughs> yeah, there's this idea essentially that, uh, that Occam doesn't want to limit this uh, idea of God's will. And so he's very focused on that. Um, so here's his argument against platonic realism uh, in terms of God's will. If universals have real existence, if we were to believe in Plato's theory of the forms here, it would follow that God would not be able to annihilate one individual substance without destroying other individuals of the same kind. For if he were to annihilate one individual, he would destroy the whole that is essentially that individual and consequently he would destroy the universal that is in it and in others of the same essence. Other things of the same essence would not remain for they could not continue to exist without the universal that constitutes a part of them. <laughs> 
Now, I don't know if I agree with this at all, but <laughs> I don't agree with this, but I'll tell you what it means. <laughs> so let's say if you, so if you, if I'm a human being, and therefore I, as an individual human being, am participating in the form of humanness, if God then wanted to just, you know, because again, the divine will wanted to just, bam, utterly destroy me, just wipe me out and have me not exist or have ever existed or anything like that. The argument here is because the form of humanness is within me and is participating in me, um, I, he, um, Occam is arguing that by wiping me out entirely, that would necessarily wipe out something that's within me, which is to say the form of humanness. And so the ideal or the eternal form of humanness, if I were to be wiped out entirely, would also be wiped out. <laughs> And as a result, it would wipe out all of you guys, you know, because and God really only wanted to wipe me out really totally. But he accidentally then, or whatever, he has to as a consequence in order to do it, he would have to wipe everybody out because of this, uh, because I'm participating in this idea of, of humanness. Now, whether you agree with that or not, I'm not sure that I do agree with that. That's his argument against that. And it's based, as you see, on his kind of attempt to um, maintain this kind of divine voluntarism so that the idea that he wants God to be able to have this much vaster uh, a, array of things that God might do uh, than we maybe we might have to ever had before in, in let's say Augustine or Aquinas. And so preserving God's will then. So in emphasizing God's omnipotence, Occam argued uh, that God must have, you know, God might have made this is one of the things that he sets up. He might have made an infinite variety of worlds. Had it been God's will, it would have been possible to create a world where thou shalt kill was called good. So it's not that we are, as later Leibniz uh, argues, in the best of all possible worlds, and that's the world uh, that God will have created. Rather, it could have been, the world could have been any particular way because God's will and capacity is infinite, and Occam doesn't want to uh, limit it. And so therefore, again, it's not that there is some kind of uh, intrinsic uh, platonic ideal of the good that God is, is encompassing or is. Rather, we just simply use the name or nominal, you nominally call something good because God is doing that, right? And it could have done any other, other of other things. So voluntarism in this way almost seems to demand, in my opinion, <laughs> that God exercise uh, God's will with some degree of capriciousness in order to show that God is act, uh, acting freely. So there has to be some kind of a, you know, if he only acts good, that would show that a limitation on the divine will, as far as Occam is concerned. So this divides God from good, in a sense, if, you, um, if we were using good as a platonic ideal. Um, and so then I think that it can have a very serious and significant results, and, and it has. Uh, for people who have kind of followed after this. So um, Augustine and Aquinas gave theists this kind of independent philosophical lens through which to discern God's expectations. You know, if God is good, love, justice, mercy, those are all um, the forms that are existing in the divine mind. Then as individuals, we people, by doing good, by loving, by being just and merciful, we are innately participants in those universals, that all of those universals that um, are God, these platonic forms are in us and we are participating in them. And that's anyway what God is, right? So that's where it had been. By contrast, if God is not innately good because there is no universal good but is only called good nominally by definition, the sole path for the theist is to discern the divine will uh, is, is simply through revelation. Uh, which is to say obedience to scripture, and Occam did call for that, and so that's his kind of idea that we can learn, go back to now focusing on that kind of thing instead of all of this kind of medieval and late antique, uh, say Greek philosophy, theology kind of ideas. And so thus there are any number of activities that might seem immoral, they could be justified by one particular interpretation of scripture, and then that, in my view, I'm just gonna editorialize here, <laughs> Um, has potentially quite dangerous results, and um, there are all kinds of examples uh, throughout time and in recent history even of when people, you know, believe that they are acting either through personal revelation or through a scriptural interpretation or anything like that where they do uh, things which, let's say, in the bigger perspective outside of their particular interpretation seem quite atrocious, um, you know, murdering sprees or any number of things, uh, even though they feel justified because they have a revelation they believe to do those things. <coughs>
Okay, and so that's theological consequences. <laughs> and, and because in some sense, um, some, uh, some fundamentalist Protestantism and things like that does uh, focus on divine will a lot more than any kind of, let's say, uh, Aquinas or Plato's or Augustine's kind of uh, platonic idealism um, that is with us. Um, it's also true in some kind portions of um, Islam where some, in some portions of Judaism where, where there was more comfort in the first place with the focus on the divine will. Um, and anyway, we'll, we'll, we can look at medieval Islamic theology too. But anyway, I would just say that in the Abrahamic religions, this kind of idea, nominalism, has had effects that kind of resonate with some of the sects that exist are with us today. Philosophically, there's also a bunch of consequences of the razor, and uh, they're pretty stark too, whether they're good or ill. So one of the things we mentioned is then by rejecting f uh, the forms, Occam returned that conversation to that first or uh, argument by Gorgias and the Sophist, one that there's no essential meaning to anything. That's the first um, assertion that Gorgias made. Subsequently then, modern and postmodern philosophy have revived the other two in kind of in a way that there's nothing new under the sun, right? <laughs> so we always come back to where we were. So the second point that Gorgias the Sophist made was that even if there were some ultimate truth, it would be unknowable by the human mind. That gets taken up and, um, and re-presented by British empiricists like David Hume, and quite successfully. Uh, and then finally, in the last century, Gorgias's third argument that such ideas, if they were actually knowable and known, they could not be communicated to others. That's been quite explored by, for example, structuralists, um, who question whether words can be used to convey truth, considering that they are all operating within a self-referential system. And so, again, in some sense, you know, we've come back after 2,500 years to kind of where we started, <laughs> but are we better off from, you know, than having gone on the path or not? So anyway, this is where we're at. So um, those are gonna be topics for future lectures because I can only cram so much in my head at once and I put as much about uh, uh, scholasticism as I could <laughs> for the purposes today. But we'll talk about those things. For now, we're just going to be content with this little introduction. Um, and we can see that maybe like a little known philosopher other than what you might see on a t-shirt or any other kind of thing, I think has added to this conversation that um, are ways that resound and are still meaningful to us today. So that's Occam, the perils of Occam's razor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.